the initial discovery, which wasn't involving me, of PSMA, which is prostate-specific membrane antigen, was done in tissue cell culture from tumors. So they literally had tumor cells of various different kinds of cancer, and they were able to identify a ligand that was highly expressed and was specific to prostate cancer among the various cancers they looked at. So that's where the name comes from. However, when you look in the normal body, that cancer, prostate cancer cells are not the only place it's expressed. So if you look at the normal prostate cells, they do express at a low level PSMA. However, most tumors, uh, as, they, as they become higher grade, not only upregulate PSMA and do so quite profoundly, you know, hundreds of times higher, but they also increase their expression in trajectory as they become more malignant. And another interesting factor is that that increased expression is been shown to be an independent predictor of bad outcomes. So if you compared PSMA expression to Gleason score on the tumors, or if you compared it to metastatic disease stage or total tumor burden, PSMA expression that we see on a PET scan or on pathology is an independent predictor of cancer recurrence after surgery or bad outcomes long-term. So it is useful in a number of different ways in terms of, uh, of patient care. Look at copper sarbis PSMA, it has probably three unique characteristics compared to other beta emitting PSMA targeting therapies, you know, like say lutetium PSMA 617 or Plavicto. So copper is held in the SAR chelator, which is a unique new design, meaning that chelator holds copper much better than other chelators. It doesn't leak out. So that allows when the, when the medicine gets to the tumor, it carries basically all or almost all of the radiation to the tumor, okay? When you look at the double PSMA binding site, that is a very significant part of the design of this radiopharmaceutical for both imaging and therapy, okay? One aspect of that is that we know from both the COBRA and the propeller trials that on the imaging side, we get a lot more radiopharmaceutical to the tumors because of that double PSMA uh, design. So on each end of a, of a flexible molecule is a PSMA binding site. Exactly what that's doing in the physiology is something we can debate, but the end results are absolutely clear. You get a lot more radiopharmaceutical on your cancer and you can see it on the imaging. You can see, you can actually prove that you can see more sites of cancer and the activity in the tumors goes up over the first 24 hours. So if you wait four hours, it's better. If you wait 24 hours, it's even better. Um, so that increasing binding is visible on both PET and SPECT imaging. And so it's very encouraging. In fact, quite frankly, uh, it's probably the best version of radiopharmaceutical in terms of getting what you inject percentage-wise to the tumor uh, that's in clinical trials or practice right now. So that's a unique design. Um, the other thing is the copper itself is different, okay? So copper 64 and copper 67 are excellent PET imaging and beta emitting therapeutics as a pair. And since you're using copper for both, your imaging agent to select a patient or even do dosimetry in advance of therapy should you wish to do so is identical to the therapy and the half-life of the drug, how long you can see it and how long it's acting in the body is similar enough that you can look at it over time. With the current non-identical pairs of say gallium PSMA 11 for PET imaging and patient selection or F18, you know, posluma or, or polarify, those molecules are structurally different than the lutetium PSMA 617. So there are differences in terms of where they go. If you're trying to just say, hey, the patient does they, do the patient's cancers express PSMA? Are they eligible for a PSMA targeted therapy? Biosimilar pairs like we have in the market right now are just fine. But if you really want to know exactly whether your molecule is better than the other ones, or you want to say, how much drug am I going to get to the cancer or to organs and really calculate it in detail, you have to have a perfect theranostic pair. And so that's a unique advantage of the copper design. Another way to think about it, some people say, well, 
if we're going to give lutetium, lutetium lasts longer. Isn't that better? Right? So you'd say, okay, I'm going to give lutetium the radioactivity, the half-life of it. So half of the radiation is deposited for lutetium over six days which means it's lasting out days to weeks before all the radiation is delivered to the tumors. Copper 67, the therapeutic version of, of this uh, trial, is you know little more than two and a half days. So you might think, well, that's going to deliver less radiation to the tumor. But in actuality, that's not what we're seeing because we are able to inject a higher dose when as we give them on the trial as we escalate. So we're hitting the tumors with a higher dose of injection and significantly more of what we inject is getting to the tumors. So we are hitting the cancer with a lot more dose over a shorter period of time. And based on what we know from radiation oncology, if you radiate with a larger dose faster, you're more likely to kill a cancer than if you radiate with a lower dose over more time. Simply meaning that you're radiating faster than the cancer cells can heal themselves. So even though even if you said it's the same calculated dose to the tumor, we're hitting harder and faster. And as a result, one would hope that the results in terms of efficacy would be better uh, with this therapy. So if you look back um, historically, when the current therapies were being brought forward. So lutetium, dotatate, lutetium, PSMA 617. The field was really forced by the FDA and not for you know bad reason to be limited by the amount of radiation dose or exposure to the kidneys and the bone marrow uh, because we knew that these medications would either float around in those areas or even temporarily stick there. And the way that those dose limits were calculated were based on external beam radiation limits. And so we're extrapolating inappropriately between two very different technologies. You know, if you hit a kidney with 23 gray of external beam, talk about hitting it hard and fast. It's boom, it's done, it's one shot, right? We know that that is much more deadly. So we know that at 23 gray, we're going to cause a significant amount of kidney injury with external beam. And we were forced as an industry, as a whole practice to say, we're not gonna go beyond that level unless we have really long follow-up like a classic medical oncology study. So there was this kind of trade-off say, well, we wanna move fast. We've got this dosimetry imaging. We can show you where the drug is. We can calculate how much is being delivered to these healthy tissues. And we were forced to have a limit of three gray to the bone marrow and 23 gray to the kidneys. But we know that we can go way beyond those limits very safely with these beta emitting therapies. And we know that from multiple trials and patient experience and clinical studies, you know, where maybe we would stop, we would have had to stop at, you know, five, six doses of one of these therapies. In reality, you can go to 20 and even in long-term follow-up, see no renal toxicity. So we've now renegotiating those things. So for this trial, we are not limited to uh, those dose limits. Having said that, in the trial design, we aren't exceeding them either, right? So, you know, as we go up, we're going up to eight, then 12 gigabecquerel. So we're already, we've already completed a cohort and we're waiting for the final follow-up for safety data to prove that that cohort, which is in, in excess of the radiation in terms of what the injected dose is that we would do, say, with Plavicto, okay? Now, Assuming that that goes forward well and really haven't seen any toxicity to date or any red flags, we'll move on into dose expansion at 12 gigabecquerel. And like I said before, the amount of dose we're injecting gets magnified by that double PSMA binding site. So it, you multiply that because we're getting more drug to tumor of, we, of what we inject. Well, it's a, it's a phase one, two trial. So the primary endpoint is safety, right? The, all of the measurements of outcome are secondary. Um, but obviously we're using the standard types of secondary endpoints that the FDA likes, you know? So you're gonna be looking at uh, follow-up CT scans and follow-up bone scans by the working group criteria. And you're gonna be looking at resist criteria on the CT scans. And, you know, we have patients 
We have one patient who went one dose at eight gig of Becquerel, um, had a very favorable response, had no other options, uh, went on expanded access after the trial got a second dose, had a near complete response by resist, complete PSA response to undetectable, and the PSMA post uh, therapy PET after two cycles showed undetectable PSMA in the tumor. So, you know, a remarkable response in a patient who hadn't even hit what we believe is uh, kind of our upper limits of the trial design. So, you know, I don't think it really matters uh, which criteria we end up using if the data keeps coming forward, like we're seeing the amount of signal we're seeing even dose escalation uh, is um, exciting. So, you know, we have these different criteria in the trial, um, but choose your criteria. Um, and I, I think we're going to have a, a winner here if the dose expansion, and then of course, if the phase three confirms what we're seeing here. So we're hoping to uh, to continue on with cohort four, which is the dose expansion in weeks to months. Um, you know, going up to four and maybe more doses, uh, depending on how the data and the safety proceeds. Um, you know, to date we don't see any red flags, right? So we're seeing um, you know exciting efficacy. Uh, we're seeing no significant toxicity to date. Knock on wood. Um, and no significant supply chain issues. Uh, you know, as you as you ramp up uh, copper sixty four and copper sixty seven, um, those supply chains aren't limited by precursor uh, material. It's just a question of you know building the infrastructure. So, you know, as we move forward, I'd be hoping that you know the the study can move forward into dose expansion uh, throughout the rest of the year, and you know turn around that data and move straight forward to a phase three trial. I mean, I'm not at liberty to say how long those things will take because there are unknowns there, but um, I don't see any red flags at this point that would slow us down.